Hello and welcome. I'm your host Petri and this show helps you to build your company. This episode is about bumpy rides, sharp turns and cuts, but also about the future of building agile companies. I talk with Jürgen Appelo, who has founded startups, written books such as How to Change the World, Managing for Happiness, Startup Scale Up Screw Up. Let's dive in. Hey Jürgen, how are you doing in Rotterdam? Hey Petri, I am doing well here. Yes, thank you. You started the Corona experience a bit earlier than others. Uh, last year you were on a holiday, summer holiday, and a lot of things happened. <laughs> Indeed. Can you explain, you know, how, how this drama started and, and then just right. like a Corona thing, it never ended. You know, it is, I guess it's still going on, but maybe you can explain, you know, what's going on. Right. Well, you're well informed. So um, actually last year I went on a big vacation to Canada that was to celebrate my 50th birthday. Um, I don't look like, I look like 23, of course, but I'm actually 50 years old. Um, and um, I, uh, I invited friends and family uh, to join me on parts of that trip because it was two months that I was in Canada touring all over the eastern part of the country. And uh, right at the beginning, I think that the end of the uh, first week, I had uh, my first accident. <laughs> I fell at the end of a hike in a forest uh, on my face. I broke my teeth. I tore my lip. I broke a finger. And it was uh, a ghastly uh, experience, I can tell you. Wow. So, uh, but I decided in the car on the way back, on the way to the hospital, uh, no, I'm not going back home. Uh, this is my vacation. I stay here. Whatever happens, <laughs> they can't, they can't kick me out. <laughs> So how, how many weeks in you were in your experience? Um, that was that was the end of the first week. Um, and I still had eight weeks to go. <laughs> wow. Did you already turn 50 so, or it was like, okay, this was just in the first 50 years? No, that was, no, I, I, <laughs> I, I turned 50 uh, two weeks later with my, with my hand in the cast. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that was the first accident, and then I had another one later. I broke a toe near the end of <laughs> near the end of the vacation. <laughs> <laughs> But you resisted. You 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 were just going on, you know, no no turning back now. Yeah, exactly. Well, the funny thing is, I had been reading about Canada, of course, up front, and they warned me uh, of the bears and 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 the other dangers in the country. But nobody warned me about the rocks. <laughs> They are much more dangerous, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so apparently they are fighting back. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, Canada was not able to kick me out. And I had a super, super enjoyable vacation there. But I say, yeah, that was just two of the things that happened to me in 2019. I also had a bit of a problem with my startup uh, that sort of failed temporarily last year I, i say you only fail when you give up uh, and i haven't given up it's more or less in a in a hibernation state you could say at this moment and ready to reboot um but yeah i lost a lot of money on that um and uh, other things happened i fell off my bike in brussels and uh, and i fell while running and i had all these accidents all year long Uh, so uh, basically, I, I, I prepared for 2020 when the rest of the world uh, had uh, uh, had entered into a, 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 yeah, a state of suffering. <laughs> I wonder what you've been eating in Canada if you if you haven't been just you know falling in all the possible places and ways before. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest, um, there's a lot of uh, French fries in Canada. A lot of uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of fatty food. Um, I see. I was not very impressed. To be, I was impressed with the scenery and impressed with the people. Very nice. I was not impressed with Canadian cuisine. There's a reason why there are no Canadian restaurants in the world. Because why bother? <laughs> You've been writing many books. And it seems that every, at least every 10 years, you write a book about the experience what you've been learning the, the previous decade. And the one which came out last year was called Startup Scale Up Screw Up. And the company you were just describing, Agile Scales, that was pretty much on the works while you were writing the book. So what happened? So is this just like another pivot or can you can you walk through a bit how it gets started and, and what about the reasons that you needed to, to uh, sack the team and, and, and put the company in hibernation? 
Sure. Um, so the idea for that company uh, was and still is that I believe we need more uh, gamification, more intrinsic motivation to achieve organizational change. I was inspired by all these apps that we have on our phones that use gamification to um, to motivate us to change things in our personal lives, like uh, um, mindfulness apps, and I use running apps and and all these personal uh, apps that we that we use. And I thought, okay, well, how how about extending that to organizations? We we want people to change behaviors on teams and uh, uh, in the, in their companies to either be more agile or to initiate a digital transformation or whatever. Um, so the idea was let's try gamification with an app. And uh, well, I, I hired a team and uh, put a lot of work in it, put a lot of effort in it, did crowdfunding and everything. And in, mean, in the meantime, I wrote a book, Startup Scale Up Screw Up, uh, which was fun because there's no, no better way to learn something than to write a book about it, is uh, what authors uh, often say. So I did a lot of research into starting up and, and, and preparing to scale up. But, um, well, things didn't work out. That's something you know as a startup founder, that there's a, only a small chance of succeeding and you start against all odds, believing that you are the one who will beat the odds, of course, because if founders were not delusional like that, then nobody would start a, a new company. So we all believe that we are the ones who are going to beat the odds. Um, and apparently, obviously, I didn't. Uh, things failed, things didn't work out, we did not achieve product market fit. People said, oh, nice idea, nice app, but they were not using it. And that's the whole point of the app is that people had to use it, of course. So uh, while we ran out of money, I said, okay, um, I, I need time to rethink this whole thing. I had to uh, indeed uh, get uh, uh, say goodbye to the, to the team. They fully understood that we had failed together. Um, and, um, well, I had to... Uh, uh, focus on, on, on other ways of, uh, of, uh, of, of earning my daily income, basically. And in the meantime, I rethink the, uh, the idea for agility scale. So the company still exists. It just doesn't do anything at the moment. Uh, but uh, everyone still has their shares and everything. Um, and that's it's perfectly normal. This is this happens all the time that startups fail and they 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 flounder a bit and then they reboot with with another way of trying to achieve the same thing and that would be a pivot if you try it again but but differently. And uh, yeah, I'm in the middle of that. Uh, just a bit of a um, thumb to cheek. So did you not follow your own advice or the advice in the book is not, not correct or it's just so damn hard to, you know, make all these things work in, in product market fit? Well, it's it's damn hard um, indeed. And uh, nobody uh, nobody says that uh, a book will give you any guarantee of, <laughs> of succeeding, if only that were the case. <laughs> so you can give a tremendous amount of, of tips and suggestions and follow them yourself, but uh, that might increase your odds a little bit. But still, there's a huge chance of failing because there are so many, uh, so many odds against you. I mean... Uh, uh, things happen in the environment that nobody uh, or very few people uh, predicted, like as we see this year with the, with the, with the, the coronavirus uh, crisis. So there are very few people who predicted that, and and but everyone else has to suffer the consequences. Uh, and uh, these things, yeah, that's just part of business life. Did you follow the design thinking and and, and lean startup methods uh, in in your own development in the company? Uh, yes, at least uh, to the extent that uh, that we could, um, but never enough, as it turns out uh, later. Um, so you, uh, the whole idea of design thinking and lean startup is that you need to have short feedback cycles with your customers, and you show them experiments and prototypes and see how they respond to uh, to uh, to what you come up with. And we did that well in the sense that we had continuous releases and, and, and we had so many interviews, so many conversations with our, with our early users. And uh, that, that, was, that was good. What we did not uh, do well 
um, was the idea of, of just observing how people behave in their natural environment, just seeing what their problems are and where your solution could um, uh it could be used to to overcome certain obstacles. That is what we did not do. We basically had a backlog of suggestions and requests from users, and and then we implemented suggestions, and then they were not using the features. And that's super frustrating when people ask you for stuff and you make it, and then they're not using it because it turns out not to be motivating for them. So. In hindsight, I think we, we listened too much to what people wanted and we were not focused enough on what they needed uh, given the environment in which they worked. Because perhaps an app was not an obvious choice. Maybe we should have looked better at how people work with each other in their, in their environments. And maybe we could have come to the conclusion that uh, using an app uh, with team members, uh, that that would not be an, an obvious uh, way to go about it, um, given what we wanted to achieve. But um, yeah, we were stuck in this direction of having an app and trying to make that work, and then soliciting for ideas, and lots of people had lots of great suggestions, and then we implemented them, and then they didn't work. So, uh, yeah, we did well in terms of feedback cycle and getting input, but we did not do it well in terms of just looking, just observing people. And I think that's, uh, that's uh, not just for me, but for many other people, a great um, uh, learning opportunity that you sometimes just need to shut out the conversations and just use your eyes and observe what is happening here. Sounds to me that you, you were having some assumptions. That one of the assumptions was that you, you need an app and, and from there you started to take the input. So the, Correct. Another way, yes. yeah. the another way would have been that you, you just go in there like in the Kadri Tulisk uh, in, in a previous episode, so just a few episodes back, uh, was talking about she, she went to, I think she was into 500 startups at the time uh, in the West Coast and she just went to a lot of offices. Sometimes she was pretending to be the co-worker or in some other... Uh, cover stories. It was just you know observing people what they were doing there, and, and that was a way to get a lot of information. And not having that, that okay, it needs to be app. Maybe it could be desktop thing or something else. It would work, but it's hard, isn't it? it it's it's quite hard to actually infiltrate offices and go to the people and, and knock on the doors and say that hey, mm, can I come in? I just don't bother you, but you know I will stare you intensively for, for hours. <laughs> sure, yeah. I'm, I'm, everything is hard. The entrepreneurship is hard. Nobody ever said that it was easy. It's it's, it's fun and it's exciting, and because it is difficult, uh, if it was easy, it would be boring. Um, and um, so it's 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 something that is uh, fun to try and and fun to do, but. Uh, indeed, as you said, um, some avenues that might be the better ones could be the hardest, and then it's easy to take another road that seems easier, um, uh, uh, but that actually gives you false information and false positives. But you thought you you could get the same information only in an in an in an easier way. So that's that is very in in hindsight everything is obvious. Uh, they call that retrospective coherence in, in, in complexity science terms. Uh, looking back, everything is always obvious. But then when you're in the middle of things, things are not obvious. And, and, and even with, with six, seven people on a team, you make decisions together that of which in hindsight you think, well, that was stupid. <laughs> it, was, it was totally the wrong thing. Why did none of us? We had six, seven smart people on a team. We discussed for hours and none of us saw this, saw this coming. So uh, yeah, it's a, you may, you feel like an idiot all the time, basically as an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, but that's a great uh, learning experience as well, and I think this is the way to also to succeed: being humble and always open to the signals. And they are usually not uh, strong signals; it's it's like weak signals coming. And another thing uh, about uh, what you say that you were listening a lot of signals and and sort of wishes from the customers. But I, I think there's a difference that you know if you ask that, would you like to have this or would you buy to get this? It's a huge difference there. You know, it's easy to say that, yeah, probably I would like that thing, but, but you know, to, to hand over the money and say that I desperately need this thing. Yeah. Is there a way to actually get to the latter one? So, you know, when you're testing things that could you somehow 
get the sort of revealed preferences from people in a way that is is more actionable and they have to commit a bit more to the whatever they're requesting well and, and i wish i had the, the 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 perfect answer to that and i and, and i don't i just i realized and i wrote a blog post about that that something we did wrong was we had something small that that didn't work and uh, based on our own assumptions and our ideas and some input from customers um, and then we added things in the hope that that would make the 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 app work usually suggestions from from users and then still it didn't work and then we kept adding things in the hope that that one of these new things would finally make things work and then ultimately we had a big thing that didn't work <laughs> So you just you keep adding stuff, uh, hoping that the next feature is going to be the one that's going to be the killer feature that everyone was waiting for. And then, nope, nope, this one didn't do it. Nope, this one didn't do it. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, that's the wrong approach, uh, uh, evidently. Uh, so I learned from that that you just have to keep trying things until you have one thing small that works. And only when you have one thing small that works, then you start adding stuff, uh, making it bigger, bigger while keeping it working. <laughs> and as long as you have not something small that works, don't even bother adding stuff. It just You should just replace stuff, throw things out and replace with something else until you have something small that works. In startup scale-up screw-up, you also stated that um, lean startup method had uh, a bit of things which are missing in the beginning and then the design thinking it's it's cutting corners uh, at the end and you have some some ideas how to improve this process and you have your own name for that as well can you elaborate a bit about that sure well first of all um the way you phrase the question implies that lean startup and design thinking have a beginning and an end and um, i would disagree with that because they are iterative approaches uh, so there's not really a beginning and an end. They they are um, uh, they are circles, basically iterative approaches of things that you would need to do to make to make things work, to run experiments and try things out and show prototypes. But indeed, there's stuff missing, in my opinion, from lean startup because the uh, the the picture, I mean the the famous picture that says build, measure, learn, um, it starts quote unquote with build. Well. What do you build? Where do the ideas come from? Um, the lean startupers say, get out of the building. Um, go and see where your customers uh, um, trying to get their, their jobs done and, and observe what they do. Same as design thinkers uh, do, and they call it empathizing, basically. Um, but it's not in the picture. The picture just says build, measure, learn. So I think half is missing, which is that whole part that design thinking is great at. Uh, design things, say empathize and then then synthesize and then come up with ideas, hypothesize. Um, so, uh, or they sometimes they do use, use different words like ideate and whatever. They're different design thinking models. But uh, but that's great. In in the design thinking models, they explicitly mention those steps from getting out of the building, empathizing with with customers. Um, but then they take a shortcut at the end, which is the learn thing in, in Lean Startup, build, measure, learn. Um, in design thinking, that is not specifically mentioned, that step. It's sort of meant implicitly, but I appreciate that it is an explicit step in, in, uh, in Lean Startup. Um, so what I did basically, I merged the ideas. I said, well, it's basically 90, 95% the same thing that they're talking about, only they come from different parts of the world. Lean Startup is obviously from, from Silicon Valley and the startup scene with Eric Ries and Steve Blank and other famous people. Um, and then others came up with, with design thinking stuff. It came from more the, the corporate world where companies wanted to create new products that would be innovative and successful. And they turned that into something defined as, as design thinking, closely related to service design, which is uh, very similar. And um, so, but they mean the same thing, just iterative process, lots of prototypes, minimal viable products, and look at how people behave, what is, what is their job to be done, and, and, and then you run tests and experiments, so all the same thing. I turned that into a new picture, basically. I said, well, um, I don't like the word 
circle because that makes it a bit like a, a discrete step-by-step -step thing which innovation isn't i know from experience that it is a messy process it is it is anarchy basically you can do things uh, uh, of, of various steps on the same day, uh, just depending how how uh, on constraints and which people are available, etc. In the morning, you could be observing customers, and in the afternoon, you could be checking the results of the latest test, and and so on. So I said, okay, I'm going to call it vortex because I found that as a synonym for circle, and I thought, yeah, that's that's a great word. That's a vortex is is non-linear dynamics. That's that sounds powerful. Uh, turbines and whirlwinds and tornadoes, those are vortexes um, uh, or vortices. What is it? Vortices? Vortex? <laughs> I don't know what plural is. Um, so vortex is a better word, I think. So I call it innovation vortex. I mean exactly the same thing as design thinking and lean startup. I have no disagreements with what the, the methods are meant uh, to be. I just don't really like the pictures that they usually come up with. And in particular, the design thinking pictures, they often look very sequential with five steps after each other. And that's, that's just very wrong. Because then it looks like a waterfall process and that's not what you want. So what comes after lean and agile? <laughs> what comes after lean and agile? Yeah, that, that's a question that people ask me sometimes. Um, I have, uh, um, I've always said that maybe at some point we're not going to call it agile anymore, uh, but it's just... Business as usual, you mean? <laughs> yeah, it's just business as usual. It's just the way we run things nowadays. Um, like like fish have no word for water. It's, it's just that's <laughs> a part of life. Um, and there's no way back. Uh, like a few people use the word cyber nowadays. That's a word we use in the 80s in <laughs> for cyberspace. <laughs> it's because that was special. But now the internet is everywhere. It's 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 not it doesn't have a, a, have the word cyber around us anymore. We have it now. That thing that we predicted in the 80s. Um, I think with agile is the same thing. The word might go away. But um, I do think, and that's a realization I have just recently in the last couple of weeks, um, our focus, our, um, uh, the next problem to solve um, is, I think, the, uh, the holistic experience of users and customers. What I mean by that is we made a switch in agile and lean thinking from projects to products um, which is a good thing, like you don't hand off uh, something to another department uh, when you're done. No, you are responsible for a product across its lifetime from start to end. Um, so end-to-end -end responsibility is something that everyone is being taught in the agile world. But the word product is everywhere, product backlog, product roadmap, a product owner, etc. Everything is around the product. Well, actually, the product is only part of the entire experience of, of a user and a customer. They have more experiences, touch points with the company. So, and I've been asking this just this week on Twitter and Facebook of my followers. Do you have examples of products that are great, but overall the experience sucked after all? And then usually it is where um, customer service uh, disappoints you or marketing is, is a huge pain or whatever. So there are reasons for people quitting their uh, their. Uh, their um, association with, with with companies or, or not using products anymore. But even though the products are great, they just don't like the business, the company as a whole, because of other parts in the organization. Vice versa is also possible. I had people say that some products were mediocre at best, but still they love the company as a whole because of its philosophy, of its purpose, of great customer service, or the marketing is awesome, or they had free lifetime upgrades or whatever. So we have to realize that the product is just one part of the entire experience that we offer to customers and, and users. And even when we switch from project to product, we are still sub-optimizing. We are still basically handing off something and say, well, this is the product, um, good luck with it. This is what we are responsible for. For all the rest, service, marketing, finance, etc. you need to be with other people. That's not our stuff. <laughs> well, then 
uh, that could lead to still dysfunctional uh, results in in the company. And for for a customer, for me, um, uh, it doesn't matter to me which part of the experience is, is product and which part is service and which part is marketing. It's all one company that I am paying to get my to get my job uh, done. And um, yeah, I think that's that's the next step that we should make in in agile. Have you already coined a term like? experience design you start from the experience and then you you build that first and then you then you put the other blocks in there like the physical or, or the intangible digital products in there and, and the solutions but you start with the feeling well um the word journey is often used by marketers user journey uh, um, the, the but that has an end and a beginning already you know it's from a to b it's yeah, a journey. yeah yes yes well the, the the beginning is is becoming aware that a company exists uh without paying them yet but there's already a relationship so that's where a journey starts you you arrive at a website or you you download an app some an app from a play store or app store or whatever uh, so the journey starts often before there is even a customer relationship. It mm-hmm. starts earlier. And the journey ends when uh, the customer or the user says, okay, that's done. I don't need this product anymore or don't like it anymore. Then the journey is over. That entire uh, journey from begin to end, that is one um, experience. Now, the word user experience, sadly, is already used for something smaller, which is the actually the interaction of a user with a product uh, but i think a bit more holistically uh here so the word uh, the 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 practice of journey mapping is uh, is uh, well known in service design and, and design thinking and i think we yeah we need to do more of that um there's something that i myself also need to do more of to, to give you a very practical example um, i have been uh, of course impacted by the corona crisis uh, myself, I did a lot of speaking engagements in the past. So, so many uh, invites I got that, well, um, I, I could accept only half, um, maybe less. Um, and that maybe makes you a bit arrogant at some point. Um, you, you say, well, uh, this is the product that I have. Take it or leave it. I have others if you don't like it. Because I, I was so busy, I turned it into something that was somewhat standard. So this is the offering that I have. Uh, happy to come over, but uh, I cannot customize endlessly because I have no time for that. But now I don't have that luxury anymore, <laughs> Petri, that the world has changed. Um, so there are basically almost no events. Um, I am doing other things now, but I am trying to customize the experience more. So last week I was in southern Germany and the organizers also had to adapt their approach because normally they would have invited hundreds of people to an event uh, location but of course that didn't happen so they just invited me and a couple of other speakers and they did live streaming from a studio that was awesome that was a new experience for me but I was. Open. And it looked awesome. That there are some tweets the audience can check. You know, in Jurgen's Twitter, you know, he was there in a <laughs> yeah. impressive setup. That was that was super cool. And um, so it, it was also for me a new experience. But I and I think it's good for organizers that they come up with new ways of organizing events because people still want events. They just cannot be at the traditional events anymore. But it, that makes me rethink my role as a speaker. And instead of offering something that is a standard package, well-defined, these are all the benefits that I offer, I have to be more um, of an interactive element in that experience and just check with the organizer okay what is the experience that you're trying to offer to your customers and what can be my contribution here um so and and that's exciting that's so i'm I'm trying to apply it to myself as well to to get rid of the the product mindset and and switch to a more experience mindset I think this is actually a really good opportunity now because we, we cannot do it live and, and the live also sets some limits. You you need to be somewhere in the States and you know if there's a lot of people, not everybody can talk at the same time, ask questions, it doesn't really work. Uh, so now when we have the digital ways of doing things, we can take a lot of questions in, we can, you know, people can jump in from their own side of the world and and you know speak directly and and even have a video picture there as well so i think this is a great opportunity to enlarge the circle in a way and make it more engaging 
Obviously, the tools are not exactly there yet, uh, but I think we already have some ideas how we can get more people involved into these activities. And I think the live is going to be the new new cult uh, in a way that you know people want to have these, like previously before in the physical, but really interactive sessions, even with the peers. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, I think uh, there will be a lot of innovation. I mean, never waste a good crisis is a, is an old saying. It's cliche, but it's true. So uh, event organizers, organizers, and speakers, and 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 others are scrambling to come up with new ways of of, uh, of solving people's problems because the needs are still there. Companies still want to transform. They they have to transform now more than ever. And, and they need some help, but a traditional conference is, is not an option at this, at this moment. So what else can we do? Um, and it's, it's a great moment to, to live, actually. It's, it's difficult uh, from a financial perspective for some of us, but it is exciting that suddenly this, this disruption is taking place and, and we have to figure out our own role in, in that. Some six months ago, uh, or about last year, you needed to let the team go. And you were like, okay, the company goes to hibernation, and then Corona hit. But that was a new opportunity for you as well. You, you started to actually double down on the things you were already building. You, you had a following, you had a business model going on for the last decade. And I think now you've been started to get traction as well. So how you've been adapting and, and pivoting to the new model? Can you explain a bit how do you build a community and how do you see the future? Well, um, <clears throat> what I'm trying not to do is is something that I have never done before because I don't like it, and that's coaching and consultancy. I, I am in awe of people who do coaching and consultancy because they have a very important uh, job, um, but it just it never resonated with me. I have always, um, uh, as I tongue in cheek uh, 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 said, uh, always always said tongue in cheek way, uh, I'm more interested in my own problems than other people's problems. <laughs> they're, they're much <laughs> much more interesting to solve. <laughs> um, so much more personal. Uh, exactly. Yes. Um, so I have always come up with, uh, tried to come up with other ways of, of generating revenue while working with coaches and consultants who are doing an amazing job and maybe helping them to get their jobs done. So that's why I have created workshops and, and, and done workshop licensing successfully. And uh, I still do that um, uh, with my with my new Shift Up brand. I did that with Mansion 3.0 in the last uh, 10, uh, 10 years. Uh, and uh, and that company is still going strong. It's, it's, it's amazing to see what the team is doing, but I'm not directly involved anymore because uh, I just wanted something else. And uh, so I started a new brand called Shift Up, uh, also doing licensing there, but also doing webinars, for example, um, because I wanted to try something new, a new format, a new approach, at least new to me. Of course, webinars already existed. Um, and just this week, for example, I did a webinar with live streaming on Facebook, and that was super cool. Uh, so I will definitely try more things uh, there. And uh, part of my, my new business is that I am I'm trying to aim for membership uh, because I believe that membership of a community uh, with, with exclusive access to um, uh, certain types of content, to my time, to each other's time, and other benefits, is something that some people, a portion of, of uh, uh, users, uh, are willing to pay for. I am a member of, of several other communities because apparently I find it beneficial to have that exclusive access uh, to pay for that, uh, I pay for that because um, um, uh, it it adds something to uh, to what I already can find for free. There's a ton of of stuff available for free on the internet, of course. But what is most precious now is is people's time, and that means that uh, that needs to be charged for at some point. If you want access to somebody else's time. Uh, you cannot just demand that for free. That somehow, some way, that needs to come with payment. <laughs> um, and that applies to coaches and consultants. That also applies to me. But I just try, I'm trying to do that with a different business model, which is which is membership. 
and uh, and that is taking off. Uh, I mean, I'm, it's not like uh, like my income from from speaking uh, a couple of uh, for, uh, years ago, but uh, it looks good. And um, uh, yeah, I'm I'm going to run many more experiments in that um, uh, in that area. For the book uh, Startup Scale Up Screw Up, you were interviewing a lot of people. Obviously, in the book, there's a lot of stories as well. Can you? Can you describe some of the stories? Maybe they're not even in the book, or something which is memorable after a few years, you know, after writing the book and hearing the stories. You know, what, what is really well done in the in the Nordics and the Northern Europe, considered to other places, and you know, something to to, to mention and maybe give some tips for the uh, entrepreneurs building right. companies at the moment. Well. Um... First of all, I, I suggested to the publisher uh, that um, I, uh, I wanted to do interviews with European startups and scale-ups because there are plenty of books on the market uh, for startups and they usually come up with the examples of Silicon Valley. Well, first of all, it would be a bit too expensive for me to travel up and down to Silicon Valley all the time, me, with me living in, in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, um, or then it was Brussels in Belgium. Um, but uh, but also because I think there are lots of companies that we can be proud of here in 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 Europe, um, and um, so I said, okay, let's uh, let's um, uh, reach out to my friends. I have people that I know everywhere in in Europe because of all my travels and and and. Uh, um, uh, my followers uh, uh, eagerly uh, invited me when I asked them to to come to their to uh, to come to their offices. So I ended up at at, at Spotify in Stockholm and at uh, um, uh, Booking.com in Amsterdam and and plenty of other organizations. Uh, and um, what's what's cool is um, not maybe not that. Um, uh, not that that they are so 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 fascinating in their own right, but that they that everyone struggles with the same problems. It doesn't matter which company you 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 come uh, you come to. It's like oh, they have the, exactly the same problems that I have, only at a much bigger scale. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, but, but somehow that's comforting or, or it's, yes, it's not it I is, don't know it is comforting uh, but still they do some things uh, a few things really well and and that then stands out like I was um, um, I was at N N26 in in Berlin the the, the, the company that does uh, payments mobile bank and they had a super cool way of of running experiments they had virtualized the entire uh, <clears throat> architecture, the technical architecture, and it was for them much, much easier to run experiments with new software than it was for a traditional bank, which is exactly the reason why they were able to grow so fast, because they were able to try things out without harming the existing the existing infrastructure and platform that, uh, that was already in place for a couple of decades. They had no legacy uh, to protect. That gave them, of course, an, an an, uh, an advantage over traditional banks, uh, so that was super cool to watch. Um, I was just a quick question there: uh, Did that come for them out of necessity of scarcity or some other restraints, or was it something they were building on purpose from the beginning? I think they were building it from for uh, from the beginning. I'm not sure, but they were very smart people. Uh, Patrick, uh, the CIO, I, I, I spoke with. I know I've I've known him. Um, for a while, and he was he was already in the agile community before I was there. I, I think so. He knew the principles <laughs> of of what it means to be an agile business. So they they knew what they were doing. It was not like they stumbled on it by accident. I'm I'm pretty sure. Um, and um, yeah, and uh, I was at um, I was in Tallinn at Pipedrive and Transferwise. Transferwise, a company, a, a, a tool that I use myself, super, uh, uh, super convenient uh, for people who need to do uh, uh, financial tra- transactions across the world. And the idea is very simple, but the, the 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 implementation is is quite a challenge. So for them. Uh, the 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 nightmarish uh, part of their <laughs> of their business is all the interactions that they have with local governments and local compliance and, and because they they deal with with financial systems in many countries in the world and they need a local player who knows the local 
a way of, of sending and receiving money and then virtualize their own system on top of that. Uh, very fascinating uh, to, to talk about that, about the, the, the issues that they, that they ran into. Um, and also and how they started their business. It was, they were studying in London and they needed to send the money over. And then that's basically how right. it started. It was, it's, it's, there are actually some podcasts where they, the, the story is told and, and I really can recommend that. You know, it's really fascinating. This yes. is, I think, the way, the typical way that uh, the problem finds the founders and not the other way around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and one thing, one that I should mention, obviously, is one from Finland, uh, Petri. <laughs> I, I was at um, Rovio, uh, Angry Birds, of Angry Birds fame um, and um, what what was most interesting there uh, in my opinion or from my perspective at least was this whole uh, concept of having lots of ideas for games but only a few ultimately make it to become a successful game and they have like the the, the whole startup world uh, exists within the ecosystem of Rovio itself so lots of employees and uh, people come up with ideas and then they run experiments and then they go through a number of stages where more and more drop out until they have some that really work and then they have trials and beta testers, etc. Uh, and uh, maybe, I don't know the percentages off the top of my head, but maybe out of all the ideas that they have for games, maybe only 10% ultimately make it onto the uh, the, the app stores. And then only a small percentage of that actually is able to make money because uh, it's, it's, it's like with movies and music. There's a small percentage that, that uh, has a high return on investment and that pays for the entire business. Uh, and the, the other 95% or whatever is, is either losing money or, or just barely, uh, barely profitable. And uh, I saw that as, as a mini uh, ecosystem that reflects how the whole startup world is, is working. Only the interesting thing is much faster because they have these turnaround times, these cycle times of just a couple of years that that whole cycle of startup scale up screw up that I describe in my book for products at a games company like Rovio, they have that in just sometimes a few months or, or, or not more than a year or two, and then the game is done, it's over, nobody wants to play it anymore because people want the next game. But the same is happening also in Supercell, who's been right. obviously yeah. hugely successful. And just uh, also with uh, Rovio's beginnings, I, I think the Angry Birds was like a plus 50th game. Exactly. So 50 trials yeah. before you get something which really works and you yeah. obviously are in yeah. dire yeah. straits before that. So uh, I, I think we should sort of somehow more emphasize that the failure is the normal thing. You know, that's sort of the normal and, you know, it's exceptional to succeed. And it's so difficult to remember that the biases right. on all those successes which are like really rare. Exactly. And, and that's, well, thank you for the encouraging words, uh, Petri. That, <laughs> <laughs> that makes me, that makes me feel that at, at least not embarrassed. Uh, I'm, it, it's, it's part of business. And uh, I think uh, many entrepreneurs, uh, like, as I said, uh, have to be delusional thinking that they will be the ones who, be, who beat the odds uh, while there's a huge chance that they, that they won't. Um, but we have to not feel embarrassed about about not having made it, uh, not having uh, reached that pinnacle of success, and and okay, I'll try again um, with 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 another idea. So I am, uh, yeah, I I don't really feel embarrassed. I feel pity. I sometimes feel stupid for for having made uh, wrong decisions, maybe in hindsight. But as I said, always. That's always uh, obvious in hindsight, but never when you're in the middle of things. But you should never feel embarrassed for having tried and not having succeeded. As long as you've learned what you did wrong, you can do better next time. And they did that with Rovio and took them 50 iterations, apparently, before they stumbled upon on Angry Birds. <laughs> well, I hope it doesn't take me 50 iterations, to be honest, <laughs> for, uh, for my next success. But at least it is okay to fail 9 out of 10 times. Actually, the statistics are on your side. Um, somewhere I understood as well that it, it's a sort of a myth or it's the confirmation bias for those who, who succeeded that when you're young, you hit the gold. 
actually it's it's when you're in your you know 30s 40s 50s and you have a lot of experience it's more likely that you will actually make it big and that it, makes it kind of, of makes sense, sense yes. because there's a pattern recognition there's experience you have the network you you have a you already know uh, what's working, what's not working, and, and have a sense of these things. But obviously, it's hard still. It's, it's a lot of timing, luck, things which are not under your control. But, you know, you, you, you try enough times and you will succeed. Just the regular VC model as well. Out of 10, there's only maybe a one uh, which pays the whole fund. So, and, and that's accepted in, in, in the financial model already there. But still, I think it's... It's never nice as an entrepreneur to understand that, you know, <laughs> your chances are not exactly on your exactly. end and maybe you have to knock 20 doors and then you get, oh, you know, the real yeah. hit. Startup Scale Up Screw Up, I'm really uh, taking the, it's, it's a really good book, so that's why I'm talking so much about it as well. Um, one thing you mentioned there, which I haven't seen too often uh, described, is that within your business, uh, your products or your business lines, if you have a bit more of, of them, they can be in a different cycles and you could, should treat them as sort of separate businesses. And, and, and that's something which might be also hard to understand. Usually we just think like, you know, in a startup, you usually have just one line of business and one business, one product. But if, if you're doing different things, the revenue models, the business models might be different and they may be actually in different states. And I think that's quite important to understand as well. And, and that was really nicely put in, in, in the book. What I yeah, call. I think that is uh, well, one of the core ideas in the book that I believe distinguishes itself from other literature in well, particularly the agile world, uh, where we often assume that a company is in a life cycle stage or a company is in a uh, in 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 uh, needs to be transformed in a certain way. Well, I say, well, actually, you need to look at the level of the individual business units, the individual types of products just take the famous example of apple uh, apple has a number of ways in which it earns money it has of course the iphone and and other physical products but it also has apple uh, uh, plus tv or whatever they call it um, they they have their um, uh, app store uh, they have different ways of, of making money and different uh, um, income streams and there are different business models that are they also need to be treated in different ways with, with other architectures and technologies um, and maturity of the, of the ideas behind them. And when you look at them uh, as a, a family of business units, then suddenly things start to make sense in, uh, in the way you, uh, you go about uh, digital or agile transformation. Because as I often use... The, the metaphor, the analogy of, of a family, of a human family. We do not treat our, our children the same as we do our grandparents, I hope. Um, we do not treat babies the same as teenagers, the same as, as adults. There need to be different rules and different kinds of behaviors for people, depending on where they are in, in, their, in their life cycle stages. And the kids, uh, we allow them to play a lot and experiment because they will need all the experience for when they achieve adulthood. It's the same with startups. They, they're mostly in discovery mode and not in delivery mode. Hopefully, at some point in the future, they will be profitable and then they will be mature. And then they have to be like the parents who raise new kids, who create new products. And Apple does that quite well. Um, there was a time when the iPhone was 70% of, of Apple's income. Um, and that worried investors. I mean, if your business is dependent on just one type of product, uh, then that could be dangerous, but that has gone down to below 50 and maybe even lower by now because other income streams have become more important for Apple. And that is, that is, that is crucial because there will be a time when the iPhone will have started up, scaled up and screwed up. It's done. The iPod is not being sold anymore by iPhone. It had its life cycle. It saved the company. It did its job, but it's, it's gone. That family member has 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 uh, gone through its entire life cycle, so the same will happen to the iPhone. So a company has to continuously reinvent itself, as games companies do, by by always coming up with new games, and they go through their own life cycle stages, and they need to be treated differently. 
And I think that is a mistake that we sometimes make in the in the agile world, where we see an entire company as one thing, and then we go in with an agile transformation or whatever. But you need to uh, go step one step deeper and, and look at individual business models, and then have different approaches because. The kids, the, the immature ones among the business models, they will probably need a different approach from the adults. And maybe the ones that we could call senior citizens among the business models, maybe we should just leave them alone. Because they had their they had uh, most of their life behind them. They, they paid for the whole business. Maybe we should just be respectful and say, well, thank you so much for having uh, led this family. Um, you, get, you can just enjoy your, the last years that you still have. We're not going to make you do new things. <laughs> I think that is a, a healthy approach. I was just thinking that uh, in gaming companies, also in the Hollywood productions, usually even these huge uh, products they put out, they're called projects, which sort of implies that there's a beginning and an end, but it's like a project. But, you know, when we have a regular startup, or company, we, you know, our products, they, they sort of have a sense and feel like it's permanent. But if you treat them like projects and you understand that, you know, it's, this is not what we do, but it's not us, it's, it's the company, what we have in the culture, uh, the problems we're solving for the customers, but, you know, there are different approaches and it's okay to start new projects and, and some projects will end and, and that's a good thing as well. And in, in games and, and movies and TV series, that there's an evident life cycle uh, but pretty much probably the same if you think about uh, software products as well they don't last that long nowadays anymore maybe three five years and then then it's obsolete for whatever reason right exactly and i, I think it's, it's different for different kinds of products of course because you cannot really compare a movie with a software product in terms of how we uh, do uh, uh, go about the, the management of their development and their and their release because obviously with a the movie there is an obvious end point and that, that's the end of the project the movie is done then it's released and nobody touches it anymore it's just being distributed with with software it's it's very different um, that's why agilists prefer to switch from project mode to product mode, keeping the company responsible for the product until the end of its lifetime. But indeed, there is an end. We just should just embrace that and say, well, uh, nothing lives forever, not even our software. So uh, let's just prepare for that and, and just accept that the company has to keep reinventing itself. You love lists, or at least top hundred uh, things. I do. And in and in one time in life, I think your website was really hitting the limits. Maybe twenty years back, you were the most. You had the most traffic, at least in the Netherlands. And uh, well, you can you can just briefly explain what, what was that <laughs> about, uh, just for the curious ones. Sure. And, and and then I have another lead on question. But let's please start. You know. Uh, w- w- how did you actually make to the dot-com boom and, and right. what happened there? Well, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite stories, so some people may have already heard it. Um, but in the, in the 90s, I had this hobby project going, and that was um, in, from 1994 to... Uh, I, start, I started uh, until uh, the end of the 90s. I had this top 100 list of the most popular PC games in the world. I started that before there was a World Wide Web. Uh, that was on Usenet. Some people may remember that. Uh, news groups on the internet. Uh, I was at the university then. And I just collected votes from people in the news groups for their favorite games. And then I turned that into a top 100 list. And that turned out to be super popular because people just wanted to know what games to play. So I, I sent that over email to people once per week, the newest list. And then when the World Wide Web became a thing, obviously I turned that into a website. Very simple HTML and everything uh, that I hand coded. (laughs) Um, And uh, that became very popular as well. Uh, uh, I was one of the first to to get an account at the first internet provider in the Netherlands, the first commercial one, Access for All. And uh, at one point they reached out to me and said uh, that my website was going through their bandwidth limit that they had at the time. And they said, yours is the first one to do that. That is not about porn. And I thought that was a great compliment (laughs) because my simple HTML 
<laughs> page was competing with porn in terms of traffic. <laughs> so um, uh, that that led to the obvious conclusion: I should turn this into a, into a startup because I was making money with with advertising and and sponsorship. That was ninety seven, ninety eight. So the conclusion was obvious. I'm, I need to make this a startup. I wrote a traditional business plan of 60, 70 pages. Uh, Your first novel. Yeah, yeah. Well, in hindsight, in hindsight, I call that my first fantasy uh, fiction, uh, <laughs> work of fiction. Um, and uh, it had all these diagrams of things going up, like revenue would go up according to my plan and profits would go up. Everything would go up. My ego would go up. Everything would, would look wonderful. I was, so it's a classic hockey stick. Yes, I was really good at drawing hockey stick pictures. Uh, it looked fantastic. And uh, it was convincing, apparently, So uh, because I became Entrepreneur of the Year in the Netherlands with that business plan and my existing business that was making money uh, on my own as a side project as a hobby because i had a daytime job <laughs> so um well um i i i focused on just a startup i got informal investors interested uh and uh, that was december 99 i hired people and then two months later the internet bubble burst now you should play some kind of sound in your podcast or something, Petri. <laughs> yeah, drum rolls. Drum rolls. Oh, yes. Whoops! <laughs> <laughs> Two months later, or oh, scream from the Norway, exactly. the famous artist. You know, <laughs> everything came tumbling down, and uh, I just had hired five people, and uh, we were there in our little office in Rotterdam and uh, my my income from advertising decimated literally in two three months it decimated uh, there was almost nothing left so yeah I was quite frantic <laughs> what do I do now and uh, well uh, we had other ideas but none of that worked because nobody had money in, in uh, all the other internet startups they 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 ran out of money as well so it was it was quite cha uh, quite a chaos so um, the crazy thing was that you still had the traffic. People were still playing games, oh, yeah, but there sure. was just no advertisement to show. Exactly. I had no way to monetize it. Uh, so I, I was trying to sell patents uh, or, and, and, and whatever, but none of that worked. So I just had to close the business. I, I was really tired after after two years. Of the, it was one half year of, of, of frantic uh, uh, looking for other solutions and all the money running out that I had received from investors. Um, they didn't care because they had invested in another startup just before me and that one hit the jackpot. I don't remember which one it was because they, they didn't care at all what happened to me, <laughs> my investors, fortunately. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, I, uh, yeah, that's, that was it. I, uh, I just, uh, wrapped everything up. I asked my employees to, uh, friend in a friendly way to please find another job because <laughs> in a few months I won't be able to pay you anymore. And, uh, and that's it. I, I vacuumed the floor, literally myself of the office, closed the door and found myself a decent job. <laughs> That was 20 years back because you could have just described like the spring this year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that, w that was indeed uh, 2001 that I, that I closed that venture. Um, and I call it now a two-year entrepreneurial workshop that I did back then. Um, learned a lot. It was super exciting. And uh, but I had to lick my financial wounds and become uh, employed as a normal person. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, I was I was then software developer, development manager, chief information officer, and then I well that led to my first book, uh, uh, my my role as a manager in a software company and in introducing agile practices. Uh, and uh, well, the rest is as they say history. And the pressing question, what was the game of the decade in the 90s, in the top lists? Do civilization. You remember? I remember I remember civilization was unbeatable. It was in the number one slot for such a long time that I got tired of it. I thought, my God, please stop voting for civilization. We know it already. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good game. Give the others a chance, but people kept voting for civilization. Um, so that was a big one. Um, and the others, uh, Descent was at the time a popular one. Uh, Doom, obviously. 
No. Uh, and yeah, that was the that was my era of of playing computer games. Then you'd be doing lists as well in books, and I think it was 150 books you listed in the startup field. What's your favorite at this point? Oh, I make lists all the time because I love lists. <laughs> And um, uh, my my favorite, I, I I don't think I have a favorite startup book to be honest. Um, there's there's not one that comes to mind right now. Well, uh, maybe I would I would say the the obvious ones: Lean Startup and and and. Uh, uh, oh, you're one, leaning to classics. Yeah, the the one by Steve Blank before that, uh, the four phases of epiphany or something like that. I think there's a new new version of it already. Now. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, but those will, those will be obvious. They're really good books, so any everyone should read them. Um, but it's a bit. Yeah. Okay. Been there, done that. Um, in terms of um, well, I I think I, I think it's more interesting to to talk about uh, briefly the latest one that inspired me. That is also really good for startups. I think is the context marketing revolution. Um, it came out earlier this year, and it is about the idea that traditionally um, in the last 10, 20 years, we've been focusing on creating content, making content, blog posts, podcasts, uh, whatever, to try and get people's attention and, and get them hooked to our stuff. And then hopefully there's a business model behind it that will that will uh, uh, allow us to make money. And this book uh, basically says, well, the world has changed uh, without us realizing there's more content produced by people than by us content producers who see it as their profession. It is It, it has become impossible to compete with all the stuff that people put out there on TikTok and 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 youtube and whatever it's just and and just that gets worse and worse so we're drowning in content we're drowning in the noise so you need a different approach uh give up the idea of creating just exclusive content and hope that people will come you have to have a different way of of uh, getting people to sign up to your business model or whatever that is. And content will play a role, but it could be the content that users themselves create. So maybe you can see a future for yourself as a startup where you do not create the best possible blog posts, but you are just, you are a curator of what is created by others. Um, and that role will then somehow lead to uh, people signing up for your product, whatever the product is. So it's a different way of thinking. And I think that was, that was for me an eye opener because it talked about the experience, the experience for users and, 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 and customers where often customers are creating more content than you as a company are, are doing. And we should just use that to our advantage instead of trying to compete with the content that our, that our own users are are making. As a funny tidbit, uh, we're recording this before the next episode is coming out on Sunday in, in two days. And the title of that episode is Creators are the New Creators, where CEO uh, from SLAS, Mika Huttunen, talks about exactly this topic. Awesome. So. So Jürgen didn't have no idea, well, so we didn't, didn't speak know. about that. So that just came spontaneously. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite word? Ooh, my favorite word. I think that would be complexity. What is your least favorite word? Broccoli. I hate I hate broccoli. <laughs> Just the word or the actual thing? Uh, the actual thing, but the word itself is already bad enough, I suppose. So yeah, I think uh, yeah, broccoli would uh, would do the job. That's a really bad word. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Um, I think uh, deep questions, deep conversations. I am. I, I tune out when people are just chatting about weather or, or worse, when people are talking about other people. That's so uninteresting, uh, but seems to be what 90% of, of, of conversations are about, is people talking about other people. 
Um, and I find that super interesting. But as soon as someone talks about philosophy or politics or, or, or whatever, um, then I'm interested. That's going a bit deeper. That's for some reason, then I, then my ears pick up <laughs> the conversation and I start paying attention, but otherwise I, I just, yeah, I just tune out. So what turns you off? Is that the same answer? What turns me off? Um, gosh, I don't. What turns me off might be the the the, the shallow thinking. Uh, the the that's the obvious uh, counterpart. I, I suppose it's as I said, people just talking about other people or, or just complaining about 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 things uh, that that actually are more complex problems than people make it out to be. Like there's this whole this just right now going on the conversation the political the, the conversation about the immigrants the the problems uh, at, in uh, in the mediterranean uh, um, with the asylum seekers etc and it's people simplify things to such a sad extent uh, where where they say no we just don't want more immigrants and all well, that the problem is a bit more complex than that and yeah, that really turns me off, the shallow thinking that you particularly see on, on social media where it's so easy to just post a really bad meme uh, about something that shows that someone hasn't really thought about what is going on. That, yeah, that's a turn off. What is your favorite curse word? Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's <laughs> almost like a musical title. <laughs> It's it's something that I and I have to admit my partner <laughs> use uh, whenever something goes wrong. And I think if you look at the words, it is it is both it is bad twice because it is a curse word because of its sexual connotation and because of its religious connotation. So it's doubly bad. But and also the combination of the words makes it makes it comical. <laughs> Uh, Jesus fucking Christ. So that's, yeah, that sort of stuck. And now it's the one thing that I say when something goes wrong. Yeah, sorry. I have a image you in last year's in, in Canada and you were really singing that too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I used it quite a lot in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Disco beats. <laughs> I love disco beats. I love dance music. I love particularly disco and dance music from the 80s and the 90s of last century that's the main thing that i listen to so whenever i hear a disco beat somewhere doom 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 then i think i'm interested then i know okay which song is that which song is that i need to know <laughs> uh, so I'm sure you have a list for that one so what what are the songs in your top two but the 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 songs in my uh, oh um one of my favorites is uh, a new order blue monday for example oh, that's classic. that's such a classic or um, um dead or alive you sp you spin me round that's wow that's such an awesome <laughs> awesome disco song <laughs> um i could go on and on but those are among my favorites yeah what sound or noise do you hate you know that sound that some people hate of crayon markers on a traditional blackboard that sends shivers down people's spines? I don't hate that, but I have good because I've heard that like at least twice in this this show. Exactly. Well, that's no, I, that doesn't trouble me. But I have exactly the same feeling, and I have shivers down my spine right now. But just was thinking of it, you know these tissue dispensers that you sometimes find that toilets in airports they are round and the tissue comes out at the bottom and then you have no. to you have to pull it out and it's like a string of tissue that comes out and then it has these metal grates at the bottom so so you can tear off a part of the tissue i hate them i just i just it's awful yes that 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 tissue that that scrapes along those those metal <laughs> Metal, the sound is just, yeah, sends shivers down. I, I never use them. I just keep my hands wet and I let them dry. But <laughs> I refuse, I refuse to use them. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? 
I have sometimes thought uh, when I am old, which I'm not, of course, right now, still very young. Um, when I'm old, I might be a teacher. That sounds like a difficult job that is actually fun to do if you do it well. And I have been somehow involved in education at a professional level, of course, for my entire life. Ever since I finished studies, I, the first thing I did was I went to a training company and started teaching people programming. So I've always been somehow teaching, educating, but then for businesses. And I thought maybe at some point I should just go to either university or high school and just enjoy working with young people, teaching something. I have no idea what, um, but I think that will be fun. Um, it will be difficult. Um, uh, for sure, <laughs> but that's something that have that have, that has occurred to me a number of times. What profession would you not like to do? Acting. I hate acting. I don't know why, but uh, just pretending to be somebody else is just is something that I feel very uncomfortable with. It, I find it embarrassing, and and um, no, I, I like being on stage, but as myself. And, and doing silly things and making jokes or whatever, but then as myself, that's you see me. That's that's it. It's the only role that I can play is me as <laughs> myself. But I I cannot play some somebody else. That's just really weird. If you could be a co-founder of any startup in any air, which one would you choose? Well, from a financial perspective, I would choose Microsoft, I suppose. <laughs> um, <laughs> Then, uh, yeah, I, I think that would be because that was, of course, also given the time span at the, at the time that uh, that would have been an interesting company to join as a founder uh, when I was still young. And uh, I don't know, maybe I would have done things a bit differently, but maybe, maybe not. That that is an interesting thought exercise. How I would have gone about things compared to Bill Gates and Paul Allen. Um, so uh, yeah, that would be my choice. I have, I would pick Microsoft. Any final words for the audience? Experiment. That's that's usually what what people ask me is is do you have one tip, one suggestion for managers or for anyone in any role? Don't don't be afraid to try things. I tried things and lots of things failed, but. I have also, I think, been quite successful in ways that other people would never have been successful because they didn't try. Um, and I came up with a licensing program for Manager 3.0 and that has been very successful for me and for other people. Uh, that was not done before, at least in my part of the, uh, of the world. And uh, that, was, that was an experiment. And, uh, and it succeeded. And for that example, I have nine others that failed that, uh, uh, well, um, that I can be, they can be sad about. But as I said before, I don't feel embarrassed for having tried because you need to try so many things for, to finally find something that, that works. So, yeah, um, it ties into the earlier stuff that we talked about. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's a good word of advice, I think, for people just Try stuff. Don't be afraid. Wow. That was some episode. Who knew that hiking and running is that dangerous? Better keep indoors, folks. Uh, if you think I should talk more, you are in luck. Just go to YouTube and find my new channel where I talk about building your startup and how to adapt to this new decade. Ping me with your comments and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for listening. Until next time.